Greetings, beloveds. This is Amy Karen Johnson, the Earth Channel. I, again, do not have a poem for you today. Last week, I spoke to you about my theory with regarding the use of the sidereal zodiac. And when I say zodiac, I mean the 12 signs, of course. And how the sidereal zodiac is tied to where those actual stars and constellations are located in the night sky. Daytime sky too, although we can't see them. And also why I choose, you know, I use the, I'm going with the theory that the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching, which I will show you on the screen here, as they are usually seen with human design, human design usually shows them according to and overlaid upon the tropical zodiac, not the sidereal. And I believe they should stay in the same place. However, I over, overlay, excuse me, the sidereal zodiac instead of the tropical zodiac. And I explained a bit more about the sidereal zodiac last time. I talked about the four elements of the 12 signs, how they are related to your purpose and evolution. And so today I want to focus more upon the 64 hexagrams and why I believe they should remain associated with the equinoxes. Um, just to reiterate, the difference between the sidereal zodiac and the tropical zodiac is that the sidereal zodiac accounts for the precession of the equinoxes, and that is caused very slowly over time by a very slight wobble in the axis of the earth. And so the point where the sun, for example, is located on the horizon or over the horizon at the time of, for example, our spring equinox, and where that is associated in the night sky with the stars and the constellations and the signs, eventually slowly changes over time. So the tropical zodiac assumes that it does not change. It does not account for that precession of those equinoxes. It believes, for example, that the spring equinox happens in with the sun aligned with the sign of Aries every year, whereas in truth, it's more so with aligned with Pisces at this time because of that slow change over time and the many years that we have been doing astrology. So the reason I am staying with the tropical locations and calculations for the 64 hexagrams as they are associated with the equinoxes, solstices, the basically the relationship of the sun and the earth as opposed to the stars is because of what human design calls the G center and I call the heart center. It is basically the diamond in the center of any human design chart. If it is defined, it is yellow. If it is open, it is white. Mine is white. We might get into that a little bit later if I have time. But there are eight gates in that G center for everyone, whether it is open or defined. Those gates are one, two, seven, 13, 15, skipped 10, 25, and 46, not in any particular order. But as you will see when I show you the 64 hexagrams, if you pause and look closely, they are all exactly opposite of each other in pairs of four. And so I will go ahead and list them for you in the order that they occur, starting with the December solstice. And I'm not going to say winter or summer in case you might happen to be in the Southern Hemisphere. So the December solstice, uh, pagans would call this holiday Yule, is associated with the 10th hexagram or gate, as we call it in human design. And that, that hexagram or gate carries the theme of how we walk through life or our behavior. The February midpoint between solstice and equinox, which the pagans would call Imolk, is associated with the 13th gate or hexagram, and that 
theme is fellowship. The March equinox, or Ostara, according to pagan holidays, or Wheel of the Year is another way to look at those, is associated with the 25th gate, or hexagram, and the word typically, or theme typically associated with that gate is innocence. The May midpoint, also called Beltane, is associated with the second gate or hexagram, and that word or theme is typically known as receptivity, and that is, has to do with the fact that the second hexagram is made up of all yin lines, or broken lines. The yin lines are signified by being broken, whereas the yang lines are solid all the way across. The June solstice, or Letha, is associated with the 15th gate or hexagram, and that theme is authenticity. The August, or Lunasa, uh, midpoint between the solstice and equinox is the seventh gate, and that has to do with our role within any organization. The September equinox, or Maven, I think I'm pronouncing that right, is the 46th gate associated with physical wisdom. And finally, we have the November midpoint or Samhain. All Hallows Eve is another, or All Hallows, excuse me, All Hallows Day. It's usually November 1st associated with Halloween, although that may or may not be exactly when the sun is in this gate, but it is the first gate. All Yang lines solid. And that theme is typically thought of as creativity. And so these eight points, we have the two equinoxes, the two solstices, and the four midpoints between each of those are all located in that heart center, that G center, as they call it in human design. I call it heart because it does have to do with love, but it also has to do with a sense of direction, a sense of identity, self, and love for sure. So love, I mean, why wouldn't you want to call it the heart? <laughs> you can ask other folks who are associated with human design. The other really cool thing about this heart center, and this definitely has to do with our physical hearts and our bioelectric fields, is that we have these toroidal fields which are centered around our hearts. And the more coherent or the more we're able to expand, the more heart coherence we have, the bigger that torus or that toroidal field gets so that it can be confined to just our hearts or it can get really super big. I mean, nobody knows for sure what the limit might be. And that same type of toroidal or torus field is located around the earth, around the sun, around any living being and any heavenly body, basically. Uh, not so much maybe the nodes of the moon, but, you know, physical planets or satellites like the moon and stars. And so that's pretty cool to think of that. Another concept that human design shares with us is the concept of neutrinos. And I have to give credit to Ra and his channeling of this knowledge into the world because he was talking about neutrinos before science was really coming out with that theory. Neutrinos are really tiny little, I don't even know if particles is the right word, but um, really tiny little things that can pass easily and quickly through solid matter. I mean, that's how small they are. They can pass through those spaces between electrons, between protons, neutrons, atoms, molecules, etc. And so it's an interesting theory to, to consider for astrology and how these neutrinos come from stars or other types of events, planets as well, I believe is possible, and influence us. They pass through us, they're sort of like the energy that is around us, influencing our day-to-day -day lives. And Further, with the association with the Earth, I 
I think perhaps most of you are familiar with the concept that intelligence may be stored within crystals. And so intelligence can be stored within the earth. Crystals are a major factor in a lot of our technology, including even, you know, quartz watches, for example. So, and I believe that Ra Uruhu, the person who channeled the knowledge of human design into the world, talked about the intelligence that that was channeled through him as coming from a crystal within the earth in Ibiza. And he's also talked about the body graphs, the basically the charts that are created with your birth date in human design, also being considered crystals or fractals of a, of a kind. And so I just wanted to make one more association for you today, and that is with the Merkaba. The Star of David is often associated with the Merkaba. Bring this so that you can actually see it. And basically with the Star of David or Star of um, Solomon, I think is another name, you have one triangle or pyramid pointing up and one triangle or pyramid overlapping and pointing down. But with the Merkaba, with it being three-dimensional, it is a pyramid. And so not only do you have three points, but you have a, a fourth one for each pyramid that is, you know, for this top, this one pointing up, I have a point pointing towards me. And for this bottom one, you have a point pointing towards you as well that you can actually see if you look closely. And so there are eight points, four points to each pyramid and eight points coming out of this Merkaba. And so I believe that is also associated with the eight gates of that heart center. And um, a little torn on whether to associate each of those gates with a particular point. Um, I do know that the pyramid or triangle pointing up is usually associated with yang, and the pyramid or triangle pointing down is associated with yin. And so each of the hexagrams, of course, have six different lines made up of either yin or yang. And so the ones that have more yin, I'm more thinking should go with the downward pointing pyramid. And the ones that are associated with yang, all solid lines, I'm thinking might be associated with the one pointing up. And so this is a, a symbol for us bringing our feminine and masculine sides together in our hearts. And, you know, I may do some more videos in the future about those different themes and the significance of those gates. But basically, returning to the concept of those different pagan holidays being part of the wheel of the year, Merkabas are meant to spin. And I'll try to refer you, if you Google Merkaba and you Google toroidal field or Taurus, you will see how they how they can be seen to spin and the Taurus spins as well. They, they are associated with each other. And the more we live our lives and go around the sun and go around on the axis of the earth during our different lifetimes, the more we are basically spun through various different combinations of yin and yang, duality, and the faster you, you go, the lighter you become, the more unified they appear and feel and seem, and the less you can really notice the differences between the yin and yang, the less they seem so opposite. And the poles are of the earth are definitely associated with that as well. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I believe that the, the flow of those electrons associated with those fields and those poles probably goes both ways, but I'm, I'm not a specialist. I'm not a, an expert in that particular field, but that is sort of the metaphor, at least, that the pole pointing up with all the yang lines 
is more where that goes out. That's our creativity and how it goes out into the world. And the one with all yin lines, the second hexagram, is more the receptivity and how we receive knowledge and inspiration. And I believe that is included in the way that we receive information from the earth herself, as I channel Gaia for you each week. And it, different intelligence from crystals as well that may, be, that may be stored there. So I would encourage you all to consider the continuum of channeling and meditation and creativity. I have definitely come to prefer guided meditation and channeling to simply trying to quiet my mind. I feel like there's so much information that needs to come out into the world. And, you know, it's it sort of begs the question, it's almost like a chicken and egg question, which came first? Um, was it the, do we get all knowledge from the earth? Is it all received by us? Or do we ever really create anything new? And I believe, I believe there is sort of a balance between the two that we do receive most all knowledge and information from somewhere else. It's all been discovered before. It's all been around forever, basically. However, I do believe that we can combine it and synthesize it in different ways, different types of synergy. And so I hope that makes sense. I hope that's a little better detailed explanation for you of why I am keeping that association of the 64 hexagrams aligned with the equinoxes and the solstices as best we can. It's not perfect. In fact, we're not going to hit the second gate with the location of the sun until May 3rd, when normally May 1st would be considered, you know, it's associated with May Day, uh, the Beltane holiday. And i that's just my impression of duality in general. There's always <laughs> some flaw, some room to grow, some way to evolve and see the different possibilities. No system within duality is going to be exactly perfect, but it's all trying to point us to the beyond, to expand our concept of the possibilities and to embrace the beautiful diversity that is out there whenever we encounter it. So let's go ahead and check in with Gaia and see what she has to say. And um, yeah. We'll just see what she has to add. Usually she reminds me of something that I forgot to share with you. I invite you to close your eyes and take a few deep breaths. So if you're hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit of cracking noise, I have some ice over in my kitchen that is melting. And it's almost as if that was Gaia audibly reminding me to mention the phenomena around water. And of course, water as ice turns into crystals, turns into snowflakes, turns into little snippets of fractals in many ways. And water also stores intelligence in the earth in much the same way that crystals can and do. And so that's one of the many reasons it's so important to hydrate. Yes, you can sometimes overhydrate. There is such a thing as too much water. 
but often, at least especially in the arid climate where I live, that is very hard to do. <laughs> and so Gaia wants to invite you all to listen to the many voices of intelligence stored within her and wants me to remind you that Gaia is, as we all are, a part of a much larger community of planets and within the galaxy. She has been visited by visitors from other planets, other star systems. And not just recently, but over many, many, many years. And so the intelligence stored within Gaia is not just from Gaia herself, but from all over. Even if you just take the concept of neutrinos and astrology, we're all influenced by the various stars, planets, and positions, like the nodes of the moon. We're all connected. And so that's just one more reason that diversity is so important and valuable and precious. And so, yes, always pursue your bliss. Follow anything that lights you up. And accept it when other people are interested in other things. Do your best not to see as those things as mutually exclusive because they almost never are. Think of them more as instruments within a symphony. And they can easily harmonize if they just openly share and receive and listen to each other and cooperate in bringing these two different or many different aspects together. I mentioned a lot of different concepts to you today, and one of the things that ties them together that I'm not sure I did mention is sacred geometry. Sacred geometry is present in Gaia, of course, nature, as well as astrology. It's present in the Merkaba. It's present in the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching. And it's present in music crystals, and there is so much wonder to be had. That's one of the things I have been lit up by recently, the wonder of these many different expressions of diversity, all with this pattern of sacred geometry running through them. The Taurus as well. Bioelectric fields. Our bodies. And so even though science goes a long way toward describing many of these things, when we open to receiving the intelligence of the ages that has been here who knows how long. We may discover new truths, new ways of truths coming together in synergy that 
science has not yet acknowledged. And so if we insist on always putting things in test tubes and under microscopes, we may miss these larger macro truths like sacred geometry. And that's why nature is such a great place to open up, to have soft focus, to see the forest for the trees. There's so much to be gained and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. All we have to do is open to seeing it and receiving it. Deep breath. Thank you so much for joining me. Namaste, beloveds. Like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified of future videos.